so we're very pleased to have this because this fits right into everything we're, we're trying to do here. Um, you're here um, to see a short documentary film uh, that presents the employment trajectories of three highly educated immigrant women from South Asia, one of the largest sources of new immigrants in Canada today. The documentary is called Journey to Find Myself Again, Experiences of South Asian Immigrant Women in the Canadian Labor, Labor Market. We have the filmmaker here, Sirbana Maitra, and actually one of the participants, actually two of the participants, the other one's going to be a little bit late, uh, Rana Khan, who's here, and Minara Begum, who will be coming a little bit later. Uh, Sirbana Maitra received her PhD here at Oise in Adolter in 2011. Um, she also got a postdoctoral fellow uh, find, funded by Shirk uh, and was working <coughs> in the Department of Equity Studies at York University and she's currently working at York University as a research coordinator for a Shirk funded project entitled <coughs> Transnational Migration Trajectories of Immigrant Women Professionals in Canada, Strategies of Work and Family. So I hope we have a very lively discussion. I'm sure everything is in the document is going to be amazing. And um, it'll lead to, um, I'm sure, a very fruitful discussion. So welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, um, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. It's been such a pleasure to come back to um, OISE after a long time and to be able to screen this movie for the first time at a forum where we are celebrating Dr. Roxana Ng's work and activism. Um, <clears throat> I have known Roxana for many years. I worked with her in her projects. She was on my doctoral committee, and she knew that we were making this film. Um, so I'm hoping uh, that you know this would be a tribute to her work. And much of the issues that we have tried to raise in this um, short documentary has been profoundly inspired by Roxana's work. And I also want to thank um, you know, uh, members of CWSC for giving us this opportunity to do, do this this afternoon. Um, I'm just going to give you a very short introduction to the filmmaking and share a couple of fun stories. But before I do that, um, I want to thank um, Rana, Khan, Minara, and Poonam, the three protagonists of the film. I mean, without their encouragement, support, and most importantly, patience, uh, we could have never completed this film. Um, also, Hiju Yoon, uh, who's not been able to come today, but she was the um, director of the film. Um, she helped us with the, uh, you know, with, with a lot of aesthetics of the film, and I'm really grateful to her for, you know, uh, ha for having her in our project as well. Tanya Dasgupta um, has sent her apologies for not being able to make it. Uh, this afternoon, but her guidance and in-depth knowledge about South Asian community and the issues of state policy and multiculturalism have been immensely valuable to this uh, film project as well. Um, the idea of the film uh, came up quite unexpectedly. Uh, it was one uh, summer afternoon in 2011, and Tanya and I, we were kind of walking back from Art Gallery of Ontario. Um, reflecting upon how do we bring closer the communities that we work with and the research findings that we have. And um, how do we reach out to those who do not necessarily have access to uh, academic journals but yet are eager to participate in dialogues um, around issues that immigrants, especially immigrant women of color, experience in, um, in Canada. So I kind of suggested that Let's make a film. And she readily agreed. Um, so there it kind of all began. Uh, we met up with the faculties from Department of Fine Arts uh, at York University because we had no idea how to make a film. So we sat with many professors trying to figure out uh, what someone described as um, the visual art of storytelling. So we kind of you know, learned about what is direction, what is production, what is distribution, what is cinematography. I mean, all aspects were new to us. And it was a long, long learning process. Anyway, so after a, quite a few months of emails and discussions and meetings, we finally decided that, yes, we are making a film. And um, after that, a year, and it took us a year and a half uh, and now we have this, uh, this uh, short documentary 
called Journey, which you know included incredible learning, work, excitement, and anxiety uh, for all of us. <laughs> we um, chose to make the documentary for three reasons. First, we feel that in documentaries, the interplay of visual images, um, interviews, and verbal narration can not only enliven the actual moments, but can su successfully blend together the scholarly world as well as the larger audience whose issues are being reflected. Second, we hope that, the, that this documentary, by putting a human face on the immigrant experience, will educate and raise public awareness about immigrant women's frustrations, struggles, and progress towards becoming full participants in Canadian society. And finally, we strongly feel that the voices of immigrant women on film will emphasize their agency rather than rendering them as passive victims. Thus, we decided that we would have the documentary focusing on the three women and for them to be the main protagonists rather than have us comment on what they are saying. We were fortunate to have Rana, Poonam, and Minara will be joining us uh, soon, who are all very thoughtful, reflective, and analytical women, and they really are the spokesperson and experts of their experiences. Um, funding. We hardly had any funding to finance our project. We were not qualified to apply to most of the agencies that fund films because either they needed experienced filmmakers or somebody who has made at least one film. We had no experience at all. York Faculty Association was generous enough to provide us with some money that covered part of the basic expenses, but um, we had no elaborate crew, worked with minimum technicalities, and were forced to keep our budget really, really low. But the lack of logistics was compensated by the immense support and encouragement we received from the South Asian community. South Asian Women's Center and St. Jamestown Women's Council generously provided us with their cooperation and experience that went far beyond anything we hoped for. long process because they also need to you know see their timings and where they can fit it but we had preliminary chats with CASA uh, and they are um, interested in hosting it next year during International Women's Day. Mm -hmm. um, South Asian Women's Center will be doing a screening there uh, where we can invite more uh, community organizations um, and there's a few others uh, who are also interested so hopefully that is one of our goals that you know, rather than having it just within the uh, universities, mm -hmm. we tend to have screening more in the communities. And um, as for the employment training programs, I mean, I myself was very interested in the issue because that was also that I focused on during my postdoc research and the interviews that I did um, with women who were in bridging programs. Most of them were very dissatisfied with the way um, you know they are trained. To become uh, to enter the labor market, especially the soft skill training, and that's one of the reasons why we um, spoke to Minara, Rana, and Puna because they have also gone through these programs and they have had so much experience dealing with so many different uh, counselors, so many different ways of you know um, going training. So I don't know, Rana, do you want to just share a couple of things that, or Minara, if you want to. I mean, your experience in the training programs or with the counselors, anything you want to share? I spoke in your video when you were asking us. Uh, in addition to that, a um, few days ago, one of my junior, uh, we studied together in the university. So she came and uh, she said, uh, she's a project coordinator, so her expertise is project management. She said, how can I start? What do I do? I said, go to the, she lives in um, Danforth. I said, um, go neighborhood link or culture link. You can find um, there. You can start the volunteering. Mm -hmm. Then you can enable yourself with the system and something. 
So she started to go and after two months she said, you know, I'm going and coming, I'm just uh, uh, preparing chair, table and everything. They're not doing it, giving anything to upgrade my skills or something. So, so what do you do? How do you decide to do now? Said my neighbor is delivering samosa and pizza to the restaurant, so I might work with her. <laughs> I said, I didn't tell her anything that not, uh, not to do that. But after 15 days, I just called her that, so why don't you upgrade your education? Uh, go to school to upgrade your English skill. Because in Bangladesh, um, uh, our first language is not English, but our official language is English, but in office we speak um, Bengali. Most of the time we speak Bengali, so our speaking skills are not that much. So there. Then I told her go to upgrade your English skills, and you can go to the any uh, community college uh, college to do something. Um, then she said, uh, "Do you think it will work?" I said, "Definitely, it will work." <laughs> and. Um, as soon as said, how can I survive now? Mm. So you can start uh, doing any survival jobs. So how can I find it? I said, go to the shops or somewhere and drop your resume. Mm. So what should I write in the resume? She said, I don't have uh, any experience like to uh, serve in pizza, uh, pizza, pizza, or team hotels or somewhere. So she was asking me, who can help me to do the survival jobs resume. So I didn't have answer. Because if you go to the employment counselor and something, they cannot fake your resume that you did something before to get a survival jobs or something. So um, sh she's helping um, the woman and she's uh, supplying the uh, samosas and some Asian foods to the restaurant and this September she started to go to um, uh, ECE. Mm -hmm. ECE, so I told her, he said, uh, how, what can I study? Because I'm, I did my master's degree in sociology, me too. I did my master's degree in sociology. So I said, uh, should I go for social service work? I said, I did social service work at diploma and uh, the field is not good. So if you go there, you cannot like blame me that I'm not getting job. Instead, you can go to ECE. If you um, feel um, you can grow there, because for me, I'm not that kind of person. I cannot grow kids, or I cannot work with kids. People to people, it's vain. So she just convinced, and she's going to school now uh, to uh, study ECE. But in the agencies, when you go to agencies, uh, luckily I have got one uh, em uh, employment counselor. He was so good, he helped me a lot. Initially, uh, before that I went to like two, three, four counselor. They were just doing their job, not for me. Mm -hmm. Not for me. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, the very first time when I went to an uh, uh, employment counselor, uh, within two or three months, and then she said, you have to work in your communication. I said, okay. So then I went to George Brown College, uh, studied English, and then I have continued their uh, social service worker diploma, and I was in Dean's List twice. So then I went to that counselor, I said, you know, I'm uh, studying social service worker and I have done my first semester and I was in uh, Dean's List and she's asking me, was it in Bengali language? <laughs> I said, what? My husband was with me and he saw I was angry and he just uh, looked at me that not to talk anything. <laughs> I didn't talk anything. <laughs> but uh, I felt so insulting. And it's, you know, the uh, agency, uh, I told that all are not uh, bad. And majority of them, they are not there to help the immigrant. They are there to confirm their jobs, mm -hmm. their survival.
not for others. This, I, I'm here in Canada like last five years. I didn't find any person in my neighborhood or my friends or anybody. They said it's useless to go to the agencies or anywhere. If someone like me or other person that, you know, I have to do something, if someone help me or not, the case is different. But agencies, are, there are lots of agencies day by day. There are, um, agencies are growing. And real help, I think it's not really working well towards the immigrant to get back in their own field or survive. Okay, yes. I can, yeah, I just go on here. When we came here, it was our choice to come here, no? Canadian government didn't ask us to come. We decided to come because of my kids' education. And uh, in Bangladesh, I was senior human resource manager. My husband was a deputy registrar in a renowned university. We had a very good life. She's my daughter. She's going to UFT now. <laughs> yeah, she is. <laughs> so when we came here, we had to rent a one bedroom apartment. And we, like, to earn $2,000 is difficult. And with this $2,000 to run a family, it's really difficult. My son always said, Mom, we came to Canada and we became poor. Mm -hmm. This is the well, that's true. Now, going back to the agencies, when I was in Richmond Hill, I went to a lot of agencies. I mean, I don't think I left any. And my experience is they offer some programs that are helpful to your overall experience of being in Canada. I like the point that you said it's not just about skills. It's about me being here and having a really good, you know, satisfying life here. So for example, Costi offers a mentorship program in which they match you with a person who's around your age and who shares your skills, not necessarily the same race or color. And I was very fortunate I got this lady who told me so many things, you know, I attended flower shows with her and uh, she even told me how to walk in the snow. Now, that's a really small point, but for me, because I had a fall and I broke my wrist, it was a big thing. So they do offer these things, they offer you networking workshops, but they can go only to that much. You know, I mean, you can attend all the workshops and I've got a stack of, you know, attendee certificates. But in the end, it's uh, maybe who you know, a lucky break. So I wouldn't put the onus on them, but I liked her point that some of them exist just because they've got the funding and we make it easier for them to exist. Mm -hmm. So th we are a number on their sheet, oh, I helped so and so, and that's it. Because I was on their list for a long, long time, but really I never got any job that I could follow up on. I was surprised that um, volunteer experience not, I think volunteer experience is often a significant thing because it shows some work ethic, you know, some skills, knowledge, whatever. Exactly. And the fact that that is not put on a resume, because when I hired staff in the position I had, volunteer experience was always very important. Exactly. And I worked in mental health, and the clients we worked with, we wanted to make sure that clients had people, uh, if they wanted, they could have a a, a staff member who was from their culture and background and spoke their language or whatever. So it was very important for us to have diversity because our, the, my staff had to really reflect the population of Toronto. So if they didn't, then that was a problem. But I, I think, and we often would have people do volunteer work with us, and volunteer work is such an important thing. And I think the other thing that uh, you did mention it is networking. And not just networking in formal networking groups, but networking like you and I met through the Garden Society, but going to uh, belong to different groups, whether it's a reading group or the library or a book club or something, just making connections because it often is who you know yeah. and know what you know. I mean, that's often very important. You know, I mean, volunteering is important, Jennifer. I mean, you know, we discussed mm -hmm. that. 
uh, but only if it's relevant. I mean, if I had my time to do it all over mm -hmm. again, I have volunteered in many diverse things mm -hmm. because that was part of the excitement of coming to Canada. Mm -hmm. I could, you know, go to movie discussions and stuff that mm -hmm. I really liked. Uh, if I had to do it all over again, I think I would do my volunteering in the field that I wanted to mm -hmm. work in. Mm -hmm. Instead of doing you know disparate yeah. things that really don't go because yeah. resume is such a big art thing yeah. that you can't put down everything on that one yeah. sheet of paper yeah. that yeah. you've got. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I, uh, I agree with Rana that the relevance So uh, I didn't find any uh, volun uh, volunteering in HR field because uh, usually HR don't ex uh, accept the uh, volunteering in HR mm -hmm. field. So. I can go anywhere to do volunteering and it's, uh, I can have connections and I think that those are, those are good, but the main thing, the foundation, you need, need a job to survive. So how long you can go without your trade to do the volunteering? Mm -hmm. Today, like every month we have to give our house rent and everything and we are uh, just end up with volunteering uh, not within our uh, profession other uh, other than other professions so it will not really help us to build our uh, resume to apply to somewhere and currently I'm doing uh, bridging programming at uh, your York University IEP bridging program they are doing in management IT and human resources I believe this is a very good initiative. From there, we, I believe I will have the um, connections. I will have my, this, I will get my destination. Because uh, there, uh, of, um, IEP program is offering mentorship. So, uh, mentors are uh, highly established in, the, um, in their field. They might give us um, light, and uh, they are offering a career counselor. If I go to them personally, I have to pay to two thousand uh, dollars for ten session. We'll get it free, and uh, the bridging program we will do three foundation program and five specialist program, or total eight uh, course, all free. So it's really a very good program. And I'm just end of the program. I'll finish it in April. And I'll get my, I'll sit for a CHRP knowledge exam. <laughs> and in, in current stage, uh, I'm not frustrated. I'm feeling good about the job. Thank you so much. Um, as someone that is very interested in, in uh, um, making the experiences and, and the stories as part of our collective knowledge, I really appreciate what, what you've done and it is important. I want to make two points. One is, is that one of our own um, PhD candidates in, in our department is now um, very high up in Ontario Women's Directorate. And she actually called me uh, co a couple of days ago, suggesting that uh, we should really reach out to them because they are trying to incorporate a lot of, of, of the experiences and ideas of, of other women's groups. And I really think that you should approach them, especially for putting the um, sort of, of of the guide or more of, of the um, background and information as, as a teaching tools together in order to put that package together. Go to them and, 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 and see if they can financially help you and support you in, in that. That would be a good place to do it at. The other thing that I wanted to mention is, is that, uh, you know, the, the uh, first question about the experience that we have been hearing, a lot of us are doing this type of our research, and, and we see that a continuity. A continuity, but also a uh, sort of a, uh, a rupture. The continuity is, is that the experiences of, of immigrant women in terms of, of racism, not 
um, accessing employment and, and the question of Canadian experience and, and education and evaluation assessment, you know, all of, of, of that. This is a continuity that, that we see throughout the history of, of Canadian labor market and, 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 and immigration history. But I think that there is also a rupture that it is very important that we capture it. And that is the change in the immigration, government immigration policies, the method of recruiting, the, all the discussion about all the training programs. <coughs> but especially, I think that at this moment, it is very important, I think, Punas, as you, um, you talked about your conversation and experience with the Canadian uh, officer when you were going through the, the, the whole process. This very process of selection mm -hmm. and promises, there is only one case that we know that have taken the government of Canada to court. Mm -hmm. And that is about the cases of a husband and wife that they were uh, recruited as accountants, but then when they arrived here, they realized that what they were promised didn't exist. So they've taken the government to court on, on the basis of, of the recruitment mm -hmm. and the process. The entire recruitment strategy outside of mm -hmm. Canada, mm -hmm. it is a huge um, lie. problem, <coughs> lies, yeah. yes. that, needs to be, that needs to be part of this packaging mm -hmm. in terms of the knowledge and the mm -hmm. tool and the guide that you are doing, to, to bring all of that together mm -hmm. so that we have the history, we have the trajectory, we have the continuity, we have all the intensifications mm -hmm. in, in certain areas that it is happening. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, I really think that the connection and networking with other women's groups mm -hmm not only South Asian, but other women's groups is extremely important for us to be able to use it as a, as a very important, powerful teaching tool in, in, in our classes. But I really think that you've done a great job and I thank you so much for all the insights. There are very important insights in, in, in this documentary that we can unpack. And, and you also have to do a, a, a sort of, of the initial the stage of unpacking for us, mm -hmm. that would be great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sherzad. I'm really glad you raised this um, issue about agencies because uh, last week there was this um, workshop that was held in uh, Ryerson University um, organized by Usha George where mm -hmm. yes. they invited um, community members and immigrants as well as academics to talk about uh, you know how uh, immigrants of color is, the, the focus was on Indian immigrants but how generally immigrants of color can integrate into the labor market and we had these roundtable discussions where many actually shared about how these agencies that exist in different countries um, and some of them recognized by the, by the government of Canada do sell these hopes that um, yes, you know, there's a lot of opportunities in Canada. You can readily get into a labor mar into the labor market. You can earn so much. And in fact, in one case, somebody told us about um, how her husband was almost forced to leave the job because the agency, the agent said that, oh, you, you, you don't need to uh, keep your job in India. You will get such good positions in Canada. So those kind of issues, I mean, we are actually, uh, we were thinking of including that in our study guide as well. So I'm great, glad that you mentioned that and we definitely you know, try to incorporate that into the guide, yes, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for um, your voices. My name is Rashmi and I am a teacher in the York Region District School Board. I am uh, finishing my master's degree at York and I've just applied for my PhD program at OAC. I've written a poem a while ago called Silent Sister, When Will You Speak? And I guess today you answered that question. Uh, another thing was uh, what you just mentioned about we came here by choice. Interestingly, I think that the picture that is painted with many countries from which Canada draws its immigration numbers, that image of a good life is deeply entrenched in those minds because I lived in Bangladesh for a while with my husband <clears throat> and there are large apartment blocks 
<coughs> in uh, Gulshan and Baridara and other places where mm -hmm. people have large properties and they may own those properties there but they're living elsewhere. Even in the Middle East where the disconnect happens where the fathers continue to live in the Middle East and the families are settled here to the extent if you phone a friend and say where do you live I want to drop something off the father might say I don't know my address by heart I have to ask my children. Now as a woman who works with teenagers and we often talk about, let's bring these stories to the academy. Let's also bring them to the children. Because one generation down, our children should not forget. And that's important. And I say to my students often, I, I never portray myself as someone who I, I don't say to them, oh, does mom need a translator? I say to them, I don't speak Bangla, I need a translator. Or I don't speak Tamil, I need a translator. Because that deficit lens is deeply entrenched in the way our children are taught. And if our children look at us as people whose language has a fragrance to it, and that fragrance comes because we speak many languages and therefore we have many stories. So let these stories continue to the children as well because they are very, my students firmly believe that people who don't have jobs, don't have jobs because they didn't do something right. Because they are being indoctrinated with meritocracy. And that's what we have to watch out for. So that our stories have worth so that your journeys have worth. And those falls on the icy sidewalks are not forgotten. Mm -hmm. So take this story to the children. Tell me how I can take this story to the children. Because I'm going to talk to them tomorrow when I go back to school. Mm -hmm. This is what I heard. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for making this film very, very powerful. I wanted to ask you how you made it. Like, did you, s was there a camera running while you were telling people about your your life? Because that must have been quite um, difficult to, I just, I'm interested in how you actually managed to have such rich interviews, you know, logistically. And the other thing I've also been wondering, just to follow up also, is just this issue of language. Because I think one of the things that, your, this film shows us that really it's not about how well you speak English um, because that sort of uh, glosses over something else. It's not that. So, I mean, what is the place of language then in your view? And also, what is, I mean, is this, uh, you, you call it South Asian women's experiences, but um, what is particularly South Asian, do you think, about this experience? Or is it? not so yeah I'm just curious but mostly I just wanted to know how, how was it to actually do an interview with somebody and the camera <laughs> well it was a bit difficult yeah. and a little awkward but you know you have these wires and stuff so yeah but we was got it one day or was it over it, many days or it was uh, over a few days, few days because they also trained us to our place of work which you saw that little bit. So yeah, it was interesting. And I like your point about South Asian in such that we all come from South Asia, but it could be any women's journey, I think. And uh, you know, as for the language, that's interesting because there's such a huge amount of significance placed on the language skills. You know, I think the Canadian government gives so much funding for uh, these little, you know, and big organizations that offer language classes. It's not so much sure. I mean, if you have a good command of the language, it helps things. You know, it does. Uh, but it's not the only thing. I would I would put it in perspective and say it's not all important. I mean, if I'm in a place where I'm communicating with people, for sure, language is important. But for other things or for undertaking the immigrant experience, language is just one. Thing. I think. Um, in fact, last week, that conference that we had at um, Ryerson, one of the um, professors, um, he was sitting with us in the round table, and he kind of pointed out that 
um, you know, one of the barriers, biggest barriers that immigrants face is language. And they need to work on their language skills. They need to have good communication skills. Otherwise, you know, there's no way they're going to get in the labor market. And um, we kind of had a um, bad discussion because I didn't quite agree with him. And, um, you know, I mentioned to him that language is just one part of it. I mean, if somebody is hiring a person, it, he or she may not have very good communication skills, but that doesn't make him or her a bad worker. I mean, it's the work experience as well that needs to be. But there is this, um, you know, this idea that um, immigrants need to work on themselves. They are the ones who are always perceived as deficient. And even in the conferences, there were people, uh, you know, professors from different uh, backgrounds uh, working on immigrants. But the overall discussion, the thrust of the discussion was always on immigrants need to work on themselves. And that included language, that included soft skills, how you dress, you need to prepare yourself. You know, otherwise, like, you know, somebody pointed out that I wouldn't hire someone who doesn't have, who, who is not being able to express herself or himself in, you know, clear ways. So those kind of things. But I think, you know, that's why I guess, you know, this issue of um, la language is also important to think about because it is, as you mentioned, just one part of, you know, of our lives, of our work lives, of our personal lives. But there are other aspects that are often overlooked when we talk about, the, you know, always immigrant experience in terms of barriers. So I guess, yes, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I also wanted to kind of, um, you know, throw out is many, many uh, women and men we met in the conference last week talked about how we need to have or need to involve employers into our discussions. And, um, you know, oh, I remember one person pointed out to Usha George that, you know, we have academics, we have community or the, uh, people, we have immigrants themselves, but where are the em employers who are actually the decision makers in, in, you know, in a big way? So, you know, um, this is something that we also hope to do. I mean, that's also another thing that we want to do with our documentaries to, you know, not only limit it within the academia, but distribute it widely and if possible, you know, have a forum later on uh, where we can invite some of the employers also to look at some of these barriers and initiate some more discussions about what can be done about the barriers that immigrants experience. But if any of you have any suggestions around that or, you know, um, planning to have some kind of a forum, do let us know. We, I know, very, very happy to come and show the movie as well. Thank you for this film. I, I, um, I hope it's. I hope it does get uh, enormous audiences. I hope that we use it widely in our classes in women and gender studies here at the University of Toronto. And I hope you'll send us information about it so we can circulate it to colleagues and make sure that happens. Um, a moving part of the the video for me is um, the part um, at the end in, in talking about the hope for the future when the the hope is articulated that I'll be seen as a whole and not just as a part. And I'm thinking about the ways in which actually the Canadian government response to the lack of employment or underemployment of skilled immigrants is precisely to deepen the focus on the part. Mm -hmm. And that is partly by limiting family migration, um, partly by using temporary migration more heavily in the pa than in the past, um, instead of allowing people to come become permanent residents and citizens. So I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on how to forestall such a reaction as a government initiative that's actually moving in the wrong direction. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the ways that some of the initiatives suggested in the video um, might articulate with two other initiatives um, around labor that I've seen recently. One is an attempt to much more sharply delimit work um, weeks, even for professional workers with the idea being that there's a problem of overwork as well as underwork and that limiting more sharply work weeks is a way of creating more high quality jobs, creating a larger pool. And another initiative is thinking about what, it, what, what the label of survival job does and how it might dismiss the forms of work and the forms of political and labor action that are trying to be in, undertaken in those workplaces to um, to unionize workers and improve working conditions and make them more than survival jobs. 
So just those reactions to those two points, how to forestall some of the government reactions that actually deepen a focus on one piece of uh, a person, just the labor skill bit, and then how some of the ideas that, that you were articulating in the film might articulate with some of these other initiatives. Actually, I mean, kind of reiterate what Sharzad was um, saying earlier that I think I personally think we need to have more discussions around these issues and to take take you know these kind of uh, issues more uh, to people who are in a you know in a position to take decisions and make changes and collaborate with them more. How we can do you know uh, demand some changes around these issues that immigrants are experiencing in Canada. Um, in terms of our, uh, in you know, the government initiatives, I mean, um, mentorship or internships that you know, um, all of them have mentioned about that, and even you know, in the conference when we are chatting with immigrants, um, they often mention that how you know when they go to these agencies or when they are made in, you know, asked to sit in workshops. Though to be very useful, they should actually lead to some kind of an internship or mentorship where mentorship where they can actually gain work experience and that would something that would be recognized by the employers and would lead them to their job. Um, so I guess uh, you know personally I would think you know those kind of initiatives might be helpful because right now even to get into an internship or a mentorship program there are certain criteria I mean even the bridging program um, I remember Minara was mentioning that it's not a straightforward uh, process where you get into a bridging program and you can immediately get a good mentor there are certain criteria that uh, immigrants need to fulfill to be able to enter into those kind of programs but you know, oftentimes there are responsibilities that you know men, act, especially women, have. I mean, they have household responsibilities, childcare, and it's difficult um, to maintain those criteria. Um, so, if those things can be taken into consideration when planning these programs, and if these kind of mentorship or internship programs can be made a little bit more flexible, so that everyone can have an access to them and you know gain something valuable out of it. I think those kind of initiatives we would be interested in um, developing or talking about through our um, documentary. So um, I couldn't see all of the movies, so I had to be in and out. Um, but thank you, it was wonderful. And I, my question is about your point on you know, the immigrants need to work on themselves and this deficit lens on them. Um, and I'm thinking of uh, thinking of the new immigration category, the new immigrant recruitment category of Canadian experience class. And I feel like that has been this idea that immigrants need to work on themselves has got huge currency. Often it comes from immigrant serving organizations, unfortunately. And it has been officialized now, legitimized mm -hmm. as an official category of mm -hmm. Canadian experience class. And increasingly, I mean, in my research, I'm finding that's going to be the major recruitment um, avenue for uh, immigrants of future. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what your thoughts um, on that is. You know, if you have any, if you have any thoughts on that, this um, idea of Canadian experience class and these people having particular embodied cultural capital, mm -hmm. they fit into the system, you know, more easily, mm -hmm. apparently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Yes. Um, um, I mean, that is definitely a big problem. I mean, this big overhaul that has happened. Um, you know, I don't know how it's going to affect the immigrants who are already here. I mean, mm -hmm. they are bringing, like, I, um, like you mentioned about the temporary workers who are coming in. Um, you know, in my research, I have seen there are so many of temporary IT workers who are being brought in to work here, where, uh, whereas there are already well-skilled IT workers living here who do not have access to those jobs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and then there's this whole thing about Canadian experience class and people being brought in or people who are already studying here can apply through that and, you know, um, get into positions. But what happens to those immigrants who are already here? Like, you know, they might be even living here for 10, 12 years but have not been able to get into the labor market yet. So it's kind of like, it seems like they are already being forgotten and, you know, let them take care of themselves, where, whereas we have all these new ones coming in, let's try to do something for themselves. I mean, I strongly feel about uh, that, and I think, um, you know, it's important that rather than um, 
I strongly feel that you know it's important that we focus on these issues. We talk about these more. What happens to the old immigrants who are already here? Uh, you know how how these new categories of immigration that has been created, how that is going to affect the old immigrants, and whether there would be enough jobs for everyone. Um, and this whole issue of immigrants being constructed as deficient, I mean, over and over again, I have seen that through my own research, chatting with my friends, um, you know, my partner um, had to go through the same kind of experiences. I was lucky to be at least in the academia, but if you are in the larger labor market, it's, it's kind of that, that we were always constructed as deficient, you have to work on yourself. And unfortunately, immigrant organizations, many of them reinforce that. Um, in fact, one of the things probably I think was well, what was good about that uh, conference last week was at least we were able to talk about these things with the, with some of the agencies and you know um, tell them about the, our concern and how immigrants are already doing a lot of work. It's already a huge step that they have taken by you know coming from one country to the other, and you know they are willing to learn. They are willing to you know get into the labor market. They have, they are learning, they are reskilling. You know, there's a whole lot of things they're doing, but but there is not enough scope that is being created. There is not enough done by you know by the government or by the employers to actually absorb the skills that they are already bringing into the country. So definitely, those are the issues as academics. I think we need to focus more on, have more dialogues, and you know, as Shrazad was saying, maybe take it to people who are in a level to make some changes and have more collaborations with them on these issues. So it's uh, one thirty now. I know some of you have to leave. If any of you want to stay, we continue to the discussion until two. So here's your chance if you want to go now. <laughs> <laughs> you have a question? Oh, um, <clears throat> just to repeat what everyone's <coughs> been saying, it, it was a very powerful documentary, and um, uh, I can't wait to um, be able to, uh, w when it's in a, uh, a form, when you feel comfortable to let it go, to be able to share it in, in my classrooms mm -hmm. and so on. Um, I was wondering if you if you put the camera down for now, or uh, whether you have plans to document like some of the some of these kinds of interactions when you share the film in different uh, groups, uh, because that would be uh, uh, fa like just fascinating for me. I would love to see uh, how people uh, interact with the film, how uh, and and the kind of discussions uh, that come up. Mm -hmm. That's a fantastic idea. I mean. I don't know if we, if we have to go through some kind of an ethical review for that because we had to go through an ethical review for the film oh. and it was a long process. Yeah. Um, but um, you know that would be good. I mean, I'm sure I'm, I'm planning to take some of the discussions from here to share with other organizations when we go to. Um, but right now, I think one of the main concerns that we have is that um, we don't have any film company to distribute the documentary, but we do want to show it around widely and you know kind of doing it through word of mouth and you know emailing people around and asking them to uh, distribute it widely but um, hopefully we'll have uh, you know we'll have more discussions and I'm hoping that the study guide, guide that we're going to prepare will incorporate some of the discussions we had today and some of the suggestions that came out of the on other people the thought that requiring Canadian experience of people who are coming from outside of Canada is so grossly prejudicial that there must be something that can be done legally, uh, wh whether in terms of legislation or a constitutional challenge to the way the government hires people or something like that. There is just it is it is such a catch twenty two that it's that it's impossible for anyone to to work with that. But there must be some route. Just on that very same point, it also seems extremely detrimental. I mean, in other words, it's it, it puzzles me. I don't I don't re work in this area or research there. Does anybody know why the Canadian government would refuse to use people who come here who have very very valuable skills? It's a brain drain that Canada is taking all these people away and then saying, but we but we won't use you. And I I'm wondering. I mean, it's it's it will help. How, how I mean, it may be professional associations that are insisting on this. I don't. 
Does anybody know what that is? Yeah. Uh, this whole thing of Canadian experience, when I've talked with a lot of people, you know, friends that I've made here, and we all thought it was some sort of like a gatekeeping exercise to keep, you know, every job is unionized. But I mean, they're recruiting. Profession. They're recruiting and lying. Yeah. They're that, bringing that's people it. over. I mean, that's and it. then they're saying, look, you, you're engineers, you're doctors, no. you, go drive a cab or... I mean, the way the boards work, you know, you've got, you're, I don't know, so far down in line that I think you're, you're lucky you're working in a, you know, the Richmond Hill Board of uh, Studies Education. But the point is that this whole thing about Canadian experience, it is, uh, you know, it discriminates. And it's a way of keeping people out. Just like, you know, you have the unions who do keep but people But they've already out. enticed yeah. these people. No, no it's a two-way thing. I would say that uh, the enticement was only from one part. I mean, it was my decision. You were missing. So I am not you, going to sit and whine. You know, they told you. Yeah, <coughs> they said that oh, this is good as gold. Right right degrees are good as gold. But sure, I have to do my own research as well. So I will not give hundred percent blame on the other. It's my lookout as well. But what I do want to. Uh, says, uh, I saw a program on TV on it, really resonated with me. There is this deliberate privatization of immigrants. They showed, you know, when I come, sure, if I want, I can go and get a retail job. You know, it might not happen straight away, but for sure, maybe I could get. I could go into Walmart and I could get a job, you know, putting mm -hmm. clothes on the line, everything. But what happens eventually is that, and my whole family could, my children could. Mm -hmm. So we all go down the ladder. Mm -hmm. And this is a very deliberate thing. It's funny that there's no Canadian experience for those kind of jobs. <laughs> so there you have it. I mean, sure, I can get a job. And you know, what are you moaning about? I've got a you know, minimum wage job. But what happens is that slowly we come down instead of you know, hopefully going up with all our experience and education. Shoma, Oh, professional organizations and the idea of gatekeeping is definitely a big piece. In the professional. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is the only expression. Yeah. Yeah. Protecting the, the professions yeah. from, yeah. Mm -hmm. But then I guess what we also need to, ve we are already talking about it here, but we need to make it very explicit that capital makes a lot of money out of these fields. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Peter Sarchak, I recently read an article, he's a faculty member, I recently read an article by him, and he he precisely, you know, articulates it along that line that it is de-skilling that benefits capital accumulation. Oh, and we wow. need to very explicitly talk about it. So let's think about the link with knowledge economy. Canada is in this huge race with UK, Canada, Australia, yeah. in the United yeah. States um, for this international labor, right? Internationally, yes. yeah. internationally trained immigrants and this race for skill. But then this high-skilled, innovation-based knowledge economy doesn't work without a secondary labor market, continued labor market, propping it up. Mm -hmm. yes. Like who is going to fix my car, sell my coffee, and all that, exactly. right? Mm -hmm. And so that link has to be met. Mm -hmm. That it's not for nothing. There's a there's a framework. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, and uh, rec there's a recent report that has come out in I think uh, from OECD where Canada is ranked as one of number one country for having the highest number of skilled workers. Yeah. Yeah. But you know those kind of state high status shows good on reports, whereas you know. Within the country, there are different levels of people, immigrants yeah. working in different. Totally hierarchized levels. Yes. Um, it's interesting because um, my field of work is institutional ethnography, and um, my gaze is on the organization. And um, I was just reading this newspaper on the train coming here this morning. It talks about how it's believed now that uh, the full day kindergarten programs mm -hmm. are not going to be as successful as they had initially thought they would be. And it goes back, when we in schools talk about EQAO data, and you spoke about OECD, the onus is once again put on the lack of Canadian experience within the children who read these tests and write these exams. So if a child doesn't know what a tugboat is, or if a child doesn't know what portage is, that's the reason EQAO scores are dropping. And uh, in the Capitol Inn Museum in Rome, I was laughing about that last year in a wry manner. There is a tablet, a stone tablet, that translated says, well, this is how classes are going to be organized. That was in Rome mm -hmm. centuries and centuries ago. Yeah. And how the cyclical stratification of society is being seen in grade three and grade six classrooms. When you're talking about data, when you're talking about reading and writing skills, and in parent councils, then parents speak up and say, 
but we come from those countries that are highly valued for their skills in language and math. Why then are our children not doing well? And then we put it back to say, but the way you teach your children at home is not the way we need you to teach them in Canada. But numbers are numbers, they say. And what then do we do, right? So that's the tension, the constant insider-outsider space that I occupy as a teacher. And then it goes back. The children don't have Canadian experience, apparently. Their parents don't have Canadian experience to teach them. And the next time somebody says, I should have went, I'm just going to drop dead because it doesn't fit in grammatically into what I was taught. And I didn't speak English till I was six years old. Brings me to Shireen Razak's article, When Race Becomes Place. I'm taking a group of students to Niagara to present at the Education Computation Organization of Ontario to their annual conference. And we are going to do little carousels on how we approach the world and how we use technology. And my students said, why are you taking us? So I wanted to know what their question was all about. I said, why do you think, you know, we've done all this wonderful work. They said, who's going to come to our sessions? I said, tell me more. They said, we're just a bunch of kids from Markham. I said, what does that mean? We're just a bunch of brown kids from Markham. What does that mean? No one's going to expect us to know anything. So when they come to my sessions, it's different. Why is it different? Because you're a teacher. Just questions, right? Just questions, but the children know. And that's my thing. Let's take it back to the children. If this has to change, let's take it back to the children. and let them write on walls. That's when, it's, that's when the structure is going to shake. And we take it back to the children. I am not even sure that that will ever change. Because in the 70s, when we take it back to the children, um, and in the films, somebody talks about wanting to belong. You'll never belong because to belong means I have to look like my friend here. And I have to dress that way, speak that way, play the same game. And my buddies here don't play the game. <laughs> but I'm just saying, this is how. So to belong means to look at yourself, not about re-education, read this, but to say, why am I here? Why did I come here? Yes, you make choices, but you didn't just make the choice. Y years gone by, somebody whispered and said, you know, if you go to Canada, because I um, at TVO, the se September was a big education month, and it was about young people from different parts of the world. Last week, they have about teachers. Mm -hmm. But if you watch um, Agenda, it was fascinating to listen to the young people. Not, uh, uh, um, some of them are 15 years old, some of them are 30, they have been to university, and they're saying what you are saying in that film today. So how are you gonna take it back to the children when they're so brainwashed already? And from, from the day they were born, and what upset me the most is when you're here, three generation, and somebody can still call you immigrant and where you come from. I mean, I mean, where did you come from? Somebody asked me that the other day. And I'm looking at this woman and I thought, wait a minute here. I'm here so long. I said, well, I'm Canadian. And she said, no, you're not. Where did you come from? The question, after 46 years, I still get that. So how are you going to take it back to your children? We have to do a whole D yep. to, to get it back to the children to say, we are Canadians, we deserve to be here and work because we're second, third generation of Canadians and we're not white. So that's how you may have to approach this if you want to take it back to the children. Yes, and also by acknowledging that this is not just the one story. 
But all, all of us stories. It, this is not just the one story, because in this silencing is also the silencing of indigenous voices, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. There is that too. So when my students say to me, but Canada is a first world country, I say to them, from whose perspective? Even asking them a question that there is a perspective. Telling them that when I was at a grocery store, right here in my Markham, in my so-called middle class Markham, when someone approached my car and said to me, nothing but asked for my cart. And there in the gathering dusk, I am standing, and it clicked that this person wanted to put away my cart because they wanted the dollar in it. And then I asked them, why is it a quarter in a no-frills cart on Highway 7? Why is it a dollar in a no-frills cart on steels? They know. They have the dots. We just have to let them connect those dots by acknowledging that what they know has worth. Because my story may not mirror the story of my children, my students, does not mean that those stories are not there. At the same time, I need to have the courage for my 19-year-old daughter to say to me, Mama, I am celebrating the Winter Olympics because I'm Canadian in a different way. You may not see that, but I have to celebrate this in a different way. And that's OK. That's OK, having to find myself over and over again, having the courage to do that. And it's not a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's a relay race. That's my metaphor. Someone has brought it this far. If it weren't, if it didn't matter, we wouldn't have been here today. OK. So you can't just talk about South Asian then, because, uh, because it's not just South Asian. I've been in this country for a long time. When I came here, we never see South Asian. When I came here, you see natives. Mm -hmm. But we didn't know they, they were. I had to learn that they were here before um, European. When I came here, if you want to see anybody else, like a black person, you have to go to Bathurst. When I came here, we came to work in the factories. A lot of my colleagues, after they finished, they were school teachers, and they couldn't get a job. Either they go back to school, or they go and work at the factories. But I know was, uh, was where all the factories were. And you go down to Spadina, and you can work, you can change jobs when I came here. Now, when you, you're here 12 years, 10 years, 15 years, five years, what does Spadina look like to you? Markham was a, a, a farm where you live now. We used to go there and pick fruits. So it's a different world from when I came here, different Toronto, different Canada from when I came here. So if it hasn't changed, and God knows a lot of women, the women movement, all kind of movement have arisen out of since the 70s on a lot of things. There's some changes, some small change, but not a great deal. So how, back to you and the children, because I, I, the reason why I'm saying it is because I have, my daughter is a school teacher and all my friends are school teacher and, and, and they're black and they're Indians and they're this from Trinidad, Barbados, everything, and they're saying what you're saying today. How do you move? the children for the next generation? I guess that question remains. At the same time, I don't give up, right? Yeah, I don't give up. A lot of hope. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm just sorry to interrupt, but uh, Rana has to leave. Um, but I sorry. want to thank you, Rana and Inara, for joining us this afternoon.